Tracy, wonderful to have you with us here today. This is your second uh, time on stage during the event. Uh, just with a show of hands, I'm curious to see from the audience who attended yesterday's diversity panel. Okay, so roughly about 50%. Um, which, which is great. We may want to kind of repeat some of the content maybe for the benefit of those that haven't been there. So just like a little bit of overlap, but not much. Uh, so uh, Tracy, let's start off with your story, your incredible story. You are uh, a software engineer. You interned at uh, Google, at Facebook. You uh, were uh, employee number five at Quora, employee number nine at Pinterest. You uh, started with Pinterest, you left when there were a thousand people, so you've seen the company grow uh, quite dramatically. Uh, and you're a founder and entrepreneur of Block Party. And back in 2013, we've seen a wave of companies in the Silicon Valley, tech giants like Apple, Facebook, uh, Google, Yahoo, LinkedIn, starting to release diversity data uh, about the number of women and minorities that they have uh, working uh, at those companies. And y one of the things you're known for is for being the person who started and caused that wave. So I would love to start us off, kind of how did that happen? Sure. Thanks for such a lovely introduction. Uh, so as Amit said, in 2013, um, I helped to kickstart that wave of diversity data disclosures. What that came out of was actually a lot of my personal experience being in the Valley. Uh, I went to school at Stanford, studied engineering there, uh, was surrounded by mostly men in my classrooms. Uh, when I started working in industry, very similar story. Um, when I interned at Facebook, for example, on our entire floor in that open office layout, there was probably 50 people within sight and there's only one other woman who was the other intern. Um, so I'd always been kind of conscious in the background that there weren't that many women around. Um, and when I started working, I started to experience it um, more viscerally and more deeply in that you know, it was a full-time job and I started to care much more about what my career prospects would be. Um, and so I would look, kind of look around at different companies and always notice where the, the women were. Um, and other, uh, actually in, in the Valley, there are so few minorities. Um, I almost never worked with black or Latinx engineers. Um, so I kind of been keeping track of in different companies how many uh, women and minorities there were. Um, but the kind of a triggering moment for me was being at a conference uh, with Sheryl Sandberg uh, in 2013 where she talked about how the numbers of women in tech were dropping precipitously. And that was just... Um, such a moment for me thinking, what are the numbers that she's talking about? We work in an industry that is so data-driven. We're talking always about instrumentation and metrics and running A-B tests to know what features to launch. And everything is data this, data that. We're using AI, machine learning. And we didn't have any data on our workforces. Uh, and so when companies like Facebook would talk about how great their uh, parental leave policies were or Google would talk about how many people they were sending to the Grace Hopper conference, uh, those, all, those things all sounded nice, but these were things that they were doing with no success metrics attached to it. Um, and so kind of taking that engineering mindset and thinking through everything I'm forced to do as an engineer, uh, which is to have metrics and justify everything I'm doing with data, it felt very obvious that we should then try to apply that to solving one of the biggest problems that we have in tech, which is this lack of diversity and inclusion. So, so what did you do? How did you start that wave? So I wrote a Medium post, um, just kind of laying this out. And honestly, I didn't expect much of a response. I thought that it would kind of go into the void and the people that already agreed with me would continue to agree and it wouldn't cause much change. But um, remarkably, a lot of people then started tweeting their um, women in engineering numbers at me, which is very encouraging. Uh, I think what happened there was that there was increasing sentiment that we needed to do something about diversity, but no one quite knew what to do. So this was a very easy, concrete action item that individuals could take. So it also didn't require necessarily buy-in from the very top like CEOs or heads of HR. People could just look around their teams and count up the number of engineers and count up the number of female engineers and share that data with me. And so even that little action from individuals 
could then help to build a data set that would be useful overall. And so once I started seeing all these people tweeting at me, I realized that there should be a better place to store that data than uh, my app mentions. So I started a GitHub repository to collect the data so people could submit it through pull requests or just sending it to me and I would add it in. And uh, part of the thinking there was I wanted to track the source of the contributions and when they had happened, uh, which is you know, something that GitHub and source control is good for. Um, and so now I think there's about 300 companies in that uh, repository that I still maintain. Uh, but I think the, the bigger point there was that people started to get okay with the idea of data transparency. And there was a snowball effect that encouraged then the larger companies to also release their data and do bigger reports. Uh, so my repository is just um, women in engineering. People have asked me to expand it to do um, racial breakdowns and other things. Um, which is difficult, it's just very difficult to define you know, who, who is a software engineer. So there's people who are engineering managers who don't write code anymore, or there's designers who write some code. And so it's very difficult to delineate all these different um, roles and the question of like uh, leadership, who counts as a leader in some companies at Google might be like level seven and above, other places anyone who's a manager. So all these things are very difficult and um, right now, we're kind of letting all the different companies who want to do more holistic reports define their own things that make sense for them. Like for Apple, for example, they have breakdowns of retail versus the rest of company, which is not relevant for uh, Facebook, for example. Um, but there is now movement towards transparency of this data, um, establishing the foundations and knowing where we are and also understanding where progress um, is happening or not. Um, so one thing that is a little bit disappointing uh, in the last six years, there hasn't been a lot of movement in the numbers in women in engineering, women in leadership, um, or uh, racial minorities. We've seen actually some percentage increases um, on the gender side, and in some cases actually been accompanied by backsliding on um, racial diversity, which uh, you know is a kind of a broader point that just focusing on gender first often doesn't really solve the overall problems, and that's something we frequently hear in the diversity circles, like, oh, we'll just solve it for women first, and then we'll get to everybody else next. Um, and sadly, that doesn't work very well. But at least we now have some metrics to understand that this is playing out. I find it quite mind-blowing that companies, tech giants like Apple, Facebook, Yahoo, LinkedIn, Google, started releasing basically this diversity data as a result of the work that you've uh, that you did, um, because it, it was a big deal for them. Back in 2008, uh, media reporters tried to legally force those companies to disclose their data without success. Then basically those companies declining to, uh, to be transparent, claiming that sharing that data is akin to basically giving away kind of trade secrets. Uh, what do you think made them actually eventually uh, change their mind and come around after th that call to action that you, that you sent out? I think I was in a privileged position uh, being from within the industry and being a software engineer and having gone to Stanford and worked at these companies, at Google, at Facebook. And so I had the credibility of being someone on the inside, someone who's worked um, on the hiring side, had to do interviews, do recruiting, staffed career fair boots. Um, so I think I, I was in a better position than some of the people from the outside who were trying to bang on the doors of the tech companies and ask for this. Um, but I think there is also just uh, broader currents um, in the industry and more people talking about diversity. I think that set more of a backdrop. Um, but I think the, the really important thing actually was that um, okay, what I've heard through the grapevine is my Medium post got circulated at Google and it was uh, kind of running through Google HR and uh, people were discussing if they should be more transparent about their data. And eventually the request got floated all the way up to Larry Page, who made the call to release Google's data uh, over the objections of the legal team who thought that it might open them up to discrimination lawsuits. Um, and it was, risky. it was a risky move for Google to do that. They were the first mover. And there is a possibility that um, there could have been strong backlash and um, you know, legal complaints. But they put it out there. Um, and they were widely praised for that. There was still some criticism, the numbers were bad, but um, once they moved, then all the other companies followed. And I think there's a, a little bit of that, it's not quite FOMO, but they wanted to show that they were also leaders. And if Google was gonna do this, and you know, that was a, 
you know, a worthy leader to follow and try to be um, kind of aligned with. Um, and to once all these companies have released their data, I think it made it less risky for any, any new companies to, um, because it was no longer just a single company that's discriminatory, but uh, you know, an industry-wide problem. That's, that's absolutely incredible. And you mentioned numbers are bad, so how bad are the numbers? Uh, for women in engineering, uh, it's anywhere between 10 to now 25% um, female. I mean, most of the big companies, when the reports first started coming out in 2013, 2014, were around like 15, 16, 17%. Um, and le women in leadership was maybe like 20%, um, but again, it's a little bit difficult to define leadership exactly. Uh, in the last five years, those numbers have moved up by you know, anywhere between, let's say, like three to five percent. So we're starting to see women in tech numbers be like upwards of 20 percent, a lot of these companies. Again, the definitions are a little bit tricky, so women in tech often includes not just women in engineering, but also design, product. Sometimes it's everyone who rolls up into the tech org, and so sometimes that counts EAs, two VPs of engineering. But we are seeing some rough movements upward. Um, for minorities, uh, black and Latinx in industry is usually low single digit percentages. Um, it's moved up in some cases. Um, but for just for context, in the States, uh, I think it's, it was like maybe 18, 20 percent um, Latinx uh, in the overall population, and black is also maybe like 16 to 18 percent. So they're far underrepresented in the tech workforce. So, um, so the numbers are pretty pretty low. Obviously, uh, those uh, minority and and women are very much underrepresented compared to their uh, overall in the numbers in the workforce. So let's talk for a second about why is this a problem and why should we even fix it. And I know that this is a similar problem, to a similar question to what was discussed yesterday in the panel. But maybe kind of a quick overview for those who weren't there. Why should we fix? Uh, this problem. I know Catherine, uh, if she's here uh, from the panel, mentioned, well, you know, the numbers in the workforce, women are 50% of the workforce. Uh, in tech, it's like 20%, 10 to 25%, uh, so pretty low. That by itself should be the only reason that matters and uh, is just the right thing. You don't need any additional reason uh, beyond this particular reason, which I completely agree with. And at the same time, uh, in the current state of the industry, men hold positions of power and privilege. And if we want to move to a more equitable industry, uh, perhaps the, uh, unfortunately, the moral argument might not be enough. So what other, are there any other reasons for moving towards a more equitable tech industry? Yeah, so there's plenty of research that shows that uh, more diverse teams are more innovative and more successful business-wise, but I think that can feel a little bit abstract. So just knowing that there have been these studies that say that you'll increase your financial performance by 30% maybe is not that useful for convincing people. Um, in the tech industry, we are building products for everyone, and we'll be more effective at building these products if we are incorporating the viewpoints, perspectives, backgrounds, experiences of everyone, um, and there have been pretty um, flagrant examples in recent history of, um, kind of like missteps when, and blind spots. Um, so let's take one example of Google Photos. So they had automatic tagging of people and objects, locations, um, machine learning, computer vision stuff. Um, when they launched it, uh, someone discovered that it was tagging black people as gorillas. So that's a bit of a product problem. It's also, uh, there's a, a big other set of questions around bias in data sets for training AI, machine learning. Um, but this is an example of probably people within the team were testing, and I'm sure they tested it on themselves. It's naturally what you do. Um, but just because it works for the people on your team doesn't mean it's going to generalize very well, especially if your team is not diverse. Um, some examples um, from Pinterest, like when we were first looking at um, identifying dresses or some of the different search terms that people had, our team was mostly male and didn't have any sort of intuition for what they were trying to build, so they could only rely on metrics. But again, metrics can, they're, they're good in some cases, in other cases, if you don't perfectly define them, you can skew towards game, just trying to optimize the wrong things without the intuition that you need for your product. Um, what are some other examples? One that I mentioned yesterday um, was Apple Health Kit when they launched um, for, they could track anything like sodium, 
intake, your um, whatever, breathalyzer, there's all sorts of things you could track around your health, um, but it didn't have period tracking, which is the, the one thing that women have been doing in terms of quantified self for millennia. Um, they did introduce it later, but these are just um, examples of oversights that probably wouldn't have happened with more diversity on the team. And th that's fascinating. And, and are you, do you have personal experience right, being a female engineer on some teams that you directed a product to a direction that perhaps was uh, would have been missed otherwise? Yeah, actually very early on at Quora. So I joined as a second engineer there. Um, we were still in the pretty early phases of building the product, but the first thing that I built was the block button because someone was harassing me and I didn't want to get his messages and notifications anymore. Uh, and I think it's quite likely that if I hadn't been there and had this experience of being harassed on Quora itself, uh, when we only had a few thousand users, so it was quite early. If I hadn't been there, I'm sure we d would not have prioritized building uh, the block button or other moderation tools, which I was then also the lead on. Um, and I think there are kind of the examples of companies that evolved in a different direction. So a lot of the social platforms now, like Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, they didn't have as much representation um, of women and minorities or other marginalized groups in their teams early, and they didn't prioritize anti-harassment, anti-abuse features, and we're seeing this play out at very large scale now. Like on Twitter, for example, I get a lot of abuse, um, and just using their tools, the reporting tools, is so frustrating because I know that nobody actually cares or understands the products. Um, whereas like for Quora, when I was there early, I could feel um, the impact of building these products better and could put all that product insight and also um, communication I have with the other moderators into building better tools. So um, numbers are abysmal in the industry. It's really important to solve this problem because uh, and, and to have more diverse teams because they're more effective and because they're uh, bringing insights that otherwise homogenous teams would miss and overlook. Let's talk a little bit about why is this, this is the case. So in 2016, Facebook uh, published a controversial diversity report where they basically blamed the lack of women in their teams and, and minorities in their teams uh, on the, what's called a pipeline problem, which is basically essentially saying, uh, we don't have enough women and minorities in tech, in tech positions because there aren't enough women and minorities in the population with the skills that we need. Obviously, basically saying, not our problem, it's kind of the education system's problem. And the pipeline problem is, I hope you'd agree with me, is real. We're, basically, we're seeing that only 18% in the US, only 18% of all the computer science graduates are women. Um, and, uh, and this is very, the, co the reasons behind it are pretty complicated, multifaceted. There's a lot of different reasons. We don't have time to get into all of that. But I wonder, what is your reaction to uh, kind of Facebook's argument, pipeline argument? I think when companies say that it's a pipeline problem, they're trying to get out of the responsibility of addressing very real issues in their own workplaces and in the industry overall. So pipeline is a problem, but retention is also a very real problem in that people who are entering the industry, women, minorities who are entering the industry, don't want to stay because it's so unfriendly or they don't have the opportunities to advance or be promoted. Um, so just some illustrative stats. Uh, for women entering the tech industry, 41% will leave within 10 years um, and 56% will leave within 20 years versus only 17% of men. So the rate of women leaving is more than twice that of men leaving. Um, and you know, some of the objections I get to this stat would be people saying, well, maybe they're just leaving because they want to have families. Um, a lot of these people are actually switching to other industries, so it's not that they no longer want to work, it's that the workplace in tech is so unfriendly that they're switching elsewhere. Um, so they do actually want to continue working, but at that point, you know, the lack of flexibility or the hostile work environments, uh, being passed over for promotion, no mentorship, sponsorship, leads a lot of women and minorities to leave. And so this is something that the tech industry needs to take responsibility for and solve. Um, another statistic that points to the fact that it's not just a pipeline problem, is that actually in the 80s, there were many more women in computer science. So um, in the States, the percentage of women majoring and graduating with computer science degrees peaked in 1984 when it was 37%, uh, and now it's dropped down to 18. If it were just a 
you know, if, if there were no retention problems, then there should be a lot more senior women in industry because they would have entered um, 30 years ago and they should still be around. But obviously, we're not seeing those levels of representation and leadership, and the number of women has been dropping. So it's clearly not just an educational system problem. Like There's something that's causing women to not want to be in this industry that we need to fix. I think this is, uh, to me, when I heard you speak about the attrition problem, that 41% versus 17%, to me that was a big shocker because it basically means that we as a tech industry failed, failed to create uh, an environment that is inclusive enough for women to, to that, that pass through the pipeline, the educational pipeline, start working on tech and fail to create an inclusive environment for them uh, to stay. Uh, which basically means, yes, there is a pipeline problem, but the tech industry, the companies in, in tech can no longer uh, kind of uh, use this as an excuse to, uh, to not do, make enough effort to actually uh, create inclusive environment. And so, it, so there's abysmal numbers um, where uh, it's important to solve this problem. Uh, we're seeing that pipeline is, exists, the pipeline problem exists, but it's not the full story. There's another story here of, uh, of the environments that we built in the tech industry that is just not inclusive. And in this, at, at this point, let's move to uh, solutions. So what can we do? So in 2015, you decided to start Project Include. Uh, together with seven other women to move away, not just from measuring the, the numbers, the diversity numbers, but also trying to help companies solve the issue of inclusion. Can you talk a little bit about that and what Project Include is? Right, so in um, 2015, I got together with these other women and uh, we were you know, t talking about the, the state of diversity and inclusion in tech and what we are observing. And what we were noticing is that there are more people who are interested in doing the right thing, but didn't know what to do. So they were reaching out to us and asking, you know, I'm starting a new company. What do I need to think about? How do I make sure my team is diverse? Or people who are already running teams um, and just didn't know where to go for guidance. And uh, instead of having all these one-on-one -on -one coffees where we could, we could try to give them as much information in an hour uh, as we could, but they probably wouldn't retain much of it, we decided that um, it would make more sense for us to try to write down a handbook of resources um, and organize all of that and present kind of a framework for thinking about how to implement diversity and inclusion solutions. Um, so we got together, we um, put all this up onto a website, projectinclude.org. We started off with um, kind of like the values and, and kind of like the overall framing. Um, so the three very core values that underpin all of our work as Project Include is first, uh, true inclusivity, so thinking about uh, diversity and inclusion beyond gender diversity and thinking also about racial and ethnic, socioeconomic status, family status, gender identity, LGBTQ, and all these different dimensions of people's experience and understanding that we can't just solve a very narrow aspect of diversity and call it done. Uh, the second core value is um, around comprehensive solutions. So there is often a tendency for people to say, just tell me what's the one thing I need to do or the top three things and um, you know, it's easier to remember or to have a takeaway, but um, to me that sounds very much like, I wanna get rich, tell me the, the number one thing I need to do to get rich, and then expecting that you'll be rich. Um, it just doesn't work that way, and it has to be very deliberate in culture, values, process. Um, diversity and inclusion has to imbue all aspects of your organization. And so that's this, the second big thing is around the comprehensive solutions. And the, the third core value for us is um, around accountability and metrics. So this harkens back a little bit more to that work I did originally, uh, but really having to understand where you are and um, if progress is being made or not, and setting targets around it. Um, so what we used to see was companies saying, yes, we care about diversity and we're doing a lot about it and hopefully um, next time we check in, we'll be better and uh, you know, without any real targets or goal setting or strategy, usually when we checked in a year later, two years later, there would be no progress. Um, so these companies would be throwing a lot of money at scholarships or just hosting networking events, but not really setting targets and understanding how to hit them. Um, and if you were to compare this to any other part of your business, like if you had sales goals, if you wanted to sell more, make more revenue, you wouldn't just say, I hope we make more revenue next year, and then check back in a year and see that you didn't make more because you didn't actually make a plan for it. So these are our, um, our big values. And then very concretely, we also wrote down recommendations um, on everything from 
defining what culture you want to actually implementing it uh, to other aspects of building a startup like um, how you do hiring, how you do manager training, how you do resolution of conflict. Um, and then again, like how do you measure that progress? Like what are the sorts of things you should be tracking? Uh, what demographic information? How do you do the slicing of that? Uh, and we're very intentional to focus on startups because um, we think that that's where there is more leverage. So before a company has gotten to be tens of thousands of employees or more and already has a culture set, it's very difficult to shift culture at that point. Like we're trying to focus on um, getting into companies early and working with their leaders as CEOs and exec team. Um, so not just have it be farmed out to an HR person who can be delegated to be responsible and then not actually be given any sort of power to implement, but really working with the CEOs um, to set up diversity and inclusion in their companies from very early on. And the hope is that out of the startups of today, which we know will grow to be big companies, at least some of them will become the tech giants of tomorrow, hopefully we can get um, more diversity and inclusion in them early on. Perfect, so if I'm an attendee here today, what should I do with Project Include? Go to the Project Include website, projectinclude.org, and read the resources. And who should I send them to? Send them to your CEO, or if you are the CEO, read them and share with your team. Okay, awesome, so projectinclude.org, send them to your CEO, to your team leaders, to your HR managers. All the solutions are there, there's some wonderful recommendations there. Uh, also, they're tagged by kind of the size of the company and their real recommendation you can start implementing and tracking in order to introduce and create and build a more diverse and inclusive environment in the tech team. So, And then one thing I would add also is that this was our best effort at writing down um, what we know to be best practice at this moment, but we also take a little bit of that sort of open source philosophy. It's put it all out there and other people will have improvements that they can suggest. So if you try to implement them and you discover that there are some nuances to it or um, adaptations that make sense for different types of teams, um, we would love to incorporate those back and share with the community. Okay, great. So with that, uh, let's open the floor for Q&A. Hi. Oh, yeah. Hi there. Um, thank you for this discussion. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, you mentioned that a lot of women leave the IT field or you know technical industry to move somewhere else. Maybe you have any kind of clue what fields do they tend to go to from the tech industry? Honestly, I don't remember exactly. I remember looking at it back then and not having it registered, so I think it is pretty dispersed. Um, some people go work for themselves, others just go to totally different industries. I actually have one. I actually have one too. Does it, does it work? No? Okay. Then I'll, I'll just use that one. I actually also have a question. Um, what do you think, what, what's the significance of the vocabulary that we use, like in, in job ads, in at, at work, you know, like the, the way we express ourselves, is that also like clearly male dominated because it's basically done by, by them or how does that impact the, the diversity factor? The words we use are very important because that's how we communicate. Um, some places where it has been quantified is in job postings. Um, I think it's broader than that, but in job postings, we've actually seen uh, the impact of the words you choose. So if you're using words uh, like rock star, ninja, or focus on um, this really hardcore and uh, kind of like more masculine characteristics, it tends to draw more male applicants. Um, and there are actually companies that are trying to focus on this. So one of them, um, Textio, you can paste your job description in and it'll actually flag the words that are more male gendered or female gendered or likely to attract male or female applicants and suggest um, alternatives to them. So there's uh, you know, framings of this is more of a collaborative team where we're looking for team players and those are more likely to draw female or balanced um, applicants. Uh, one interesting thing on this is uh, in some of the studies where they were trying to make uh, the job recs uh, more appealing to women, they also ended up getting more uh, underrepresented minority applicants also. And the intuition or thinking behind that is probably, you know, let's say you are a uh, black person and 
you read a job rec that looks very bro -y and reminds you of kind of like the white frats from college universities uh, in the States, you, you just don't really feel like it's going to be an inclusive environment, but one that seems like it's more balanced and looking to appeal to a broader set of people would also be more inclusive of you, even if it's not specifically trying to reach you. Um, so this is just on the job application side, um, but I think all throughout the company, um, I've noticed examples of like being in meetings where um, teammates would say like, oh, like, let's just get um, you know, the database guy to fix this. And it's very common to just re refer to people on the team as guys. Um, and it's not a, a big thing, but it does feel a little bit off-putting and makes me feel as a female engineer that they're not considering me for those roles. Um, and within teams when you're thinking about who do you promote to be a tech lead or a manager, if you're always thinking, uh, oh, like who's the right guy for this role, you're likely to be missing out on um, a lot of other people who just don't obviously fit that pattern. All right, and exactly on time. Thank you very much, Tracy, for, for being here. It's really a real pleasure to have you here, and thank you everyone for your attendance. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>